Well, for more on the movers out there, we're joined by Jeff Phipps, Portfolio Manager at Picton Mahoney Asset Management. Jeff, thanks so much for coming in today. Thanks for having me, Jacqueline. So the big focus uh, today was Jackson Hole and Jerome Powell. What did you take away from that meeting? I mean, I was talking about that 2% target and the, the clarity that it seemed he gave that, yeah, that's going to be the target long term. Yeah, I agree. In baseball terminology, I would say Jay Powell threw a pitch right down the middle of the strike zone. Um, he wants to maintain a lot of you know optionality in terms of where he's willing to to, to pause or, or, or stop. Um, he's in a very difficult setup with respect to some of the pressures that are coming from a tight labor market and fiscal. And I think he put to rest pretty pretty firmly the idea that he'd be changing the the long term inflation target to three percent from two, which was rumored by by some people ahead of that uh, speech. So in terms of, you know, the path forward for the Fed, um, he did sort of leave that out there that they're going to be data dependent, that, uh, you know, the decisions ahead are going to depend on how inflation, you know, uh, tracks from here. If they're making more progress, then maybe there might be a pause. Uh, and it seems like markets are pricing in the possibility that there'll be another hike, but that that wouldn't be until November uh, more so. Uh, what are your thoughts just on how the Fed sort of proceeds from here? Well, I think the Fed is actually probably aware of this concept of something like a, a two-stage disinflation, where a lot of the easy work is behind us. Some of those base effects have rolled off from some of the supply pressures during the pandemic. And now we start to have an environment again where labor has, you know, it has remained very tight in the United States. Um, energy has again provided some, some disinflationary help until recently. We're now seeing, if you look at diesel and gasoline prices, as well as Brent and WTI, we are seeing that pick up again. That doesn't work its way into the economy immediately in, in all cases, but uh, there is a good case that uh, J, J. Powell does want to maintain the ability to raise one or two more times, possibly. Uh, so for now, September is priced by the market as a skip or a pause, um, and we have to look out towards the end of the year to start seeing a little bit more of a, a hike potential price. But we do, we do still have four cuts priced uh, for 24. When does that start, do you think? The, the cut cycle? Yeah. I think, I, I, think it, I think it depends on, yeah. uh, when we think about the idea that there's four cuts priced in the, in the, in the futures market, yeah. um, that is not some firm uh, estimation of what's going to happen. That is a probability weighted sort of uh, pricing. So there's some probability that we do have a reemergence of credit and credit issues, right? And we, we didn't really have a, a necessarily a credit issue in, in March during the regional bank issues. It was more of a, a run on deposits. It yeah. wasn't a full credit issue. Um, so there's some probability of a severe recession being priced into 24. And that's being offset by what still remains a fairly resilient set of growth data out of the United States and a strong and a strong labor market. And talking about, well, just the interest rate environment, also the financial sector. I mean, the U.S. financial sector was a was a whole thing. Uh, but uh, the Canadian banks were just reporting. I wonder what your thoughts are about the environment that the Canadian banks are operating in. A, a bit of a, a mixed quarter so far in terms of the results from Royal and TD um, in in managing rising costs costs and that sort of thing. What are your thoughts on the financial sector here? I think uh, this quarter for the banks and broadly is generally reflective of uh, sort of what I've been talking about in terms of the lagging impacts of all of the tightening we've seen that really began in, in March of last year. So sure, we did see uh, net interest margins under pressure. We do see loan growth slowing down. We, and we do see costs being a real issue. And there's not a lot of ways for a lot of the Canadian banks to, to offset rising costs. Um, so I think it's indicative of a, of a, of a late cycle uh, where we are probably going to start to see more issues with credit, particularly with respect to the Canadian uh, mortgages and the ability of households to manage those step ups and rates. Um, and that process really does continue at a, at a faster clip over the next 12 or, 18, uh, 12 or 18 months. Are there particular sectors that you're looking at right now? in this environment that we're in, where there is a lot of uncertainty going forward, um, but you know where we are at in this cycle that you see opportunity. So I, I picked up honey, we, we do look at sectors. We also look at uh, equities from the, through the lens of factors. So within a sector, there are all kinds of different exposures. Uh, take industrials, for instance. There's a huge difference on how airlines and what drives those earnings and, and those stock prices versus something like the defense contractors. So yeah. what we're more, uh, what we think is going to be uh, a better place to have capital invested over the next six to nine months, given our view that we are going to start to see some of those credit issues emerge and the consumer is showing signs of slowing down. Uh, 
they're more in aligned with defensive factors, right? So things like quality, things, uh, business models that can fund without relying on credit markets. There are, uh, even within value though, which is typically uh, aligned with cyclicals, um, within defensive value, we do see a, 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 an area of there that if we do have a higher for longer environment, we do believe that that area can, can work. What we don't really like or we're more cautious on is areas that would be associated with beta or high beta, high leverage. And there are some sectors that have more of that. Of course, airlines would, would fall into that category, for instance. Um, energy used to, but energy balance sheets have, have uh, cleaned up material. And energy is probably a place that if we do get a really uncomfortable sort of inflationary push and, and a late cycle extension, that, that, that could be a place as well. But there's differences within all those names. When you talk about the, the consumer, um, we have, I mean, seen so much resilience so far. Does that start to crack this year or, and, and is it, do you think Canadians are perhaps more vulnerable than the U.S. just dependent on, you know, the amount of debt that we have and also the length of our, our mortgage terms potentially being impacted by these higher interest rates in a, in a bigger way? Absolutely. If you look at how how much less credit sensitive the U.S. consumer has become since the, the GFC. That has all to do about how mortgages were termed out much further than they were. You remember those teasers and ninja loans that were so prevalent during the GFC. Those were basically all white. In Canada um, and some European economies, as well as Australia and the U.K., we have a very, very different breakdown of mortgage exposures. And they're not, it's not all uh, you know, variable rate, for instance, but that schedule really starts uh, materializing more more properly in those pickups, that, w which will really hurt uh, uh, household spending in some cases if it continues. So I, I do think the U.S. consumer is going to be much more resilient here. Having said that, there are some cracks emerging there.